Now, we just checked out a video on why driving in Europe is much better than in America. And we wanted to check out more about driving throughout the world. And we just turned, we just turned, put in the search engine, South America driving. And this came up. And this Pan came American up. Highway, the longest road in the world. And it's hosted by no one. <laughs> one does not simply escape yeah. Simon Westmore on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, this man is inescapable. Man. Yeah, they were saying he should have a doctorate by now yeah, or something. He, I, he needs to teach out of school, damn it. Somehow, say like with all the stuff he's put out there, all this educational stuff, right? He needs to have a doctorate somewhere. Someone just give him a doctorate from somewhere, please. Yes, if he doesn't have one already, that is. Yeah, yeah no, this is going to be interesting because I've, I've heard about this a little bit, right? Yeah. In one of our videos somewhere, we've learned about this road. Right, so, right. And there's a little bit there that's never been completed and is a big old, yeah. don't do it. Don't go yeah. there. Yeah. Let's anyway, see, man. I'm excited. See. All right. Three, two, one. Imagine a road so long that it would you a month to travel from end to end, driving through frozen plains, luscious jungles, dangerous mountains, and arid deserts. It's a journey that will test your nerves, as you may have to avoid reckless drivers and hostile narcos, but also a trip that will expose you to breathtaking natural sights and engineering marvels. This is definitely not your ordinary daily commute, although London's M25 might take you just as long on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> the road I'm talking about is the Pan American Highway, or Autopista Americana, the longest motorable road in the world. So, adjust your mirrors and buckle up for today's video as we explore the countries traversed by this tarmacked backbone of the Americas. <laughs> Let's start with some interesting geographic facts about this impressive road. The Pan American Highway connects the furthermost tips of North and South America, stretching for a distance of over 48,000 kilometers or 30,000 miles. Wow. The starting point of the journey may be Ushuaia in Argentina. From there, adventurers can travel in a northern direction until they reach their final destination, a town in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, named Dead Horse. This highway was not conceived as a single project from the start. So I'll get into its history later, but the Pan American is the result of several different developments which became interconnected over the 20th century. The main stretch of the highway is the one connecting the city of Nuevo Laredo on the Mexican-US border with Argentine capital Buenos Aires. Up to this day, it is only this segment which is actually considered to be the official Pan American highway. The other sections, stretching north and south, are unofficial elements. All in all, these official and unofficial ribbons of asphalt tie up a neat contest continental package of 14 American countries. From Dead Horse to Ushuaia, these are the United States, Canada, the United States again, Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Argentina, Chile, and Argentina again. Along the way, one may experience all the major climate zones and landscapes that Earth has to offer, from Arctic tundra to boreal forests to tropical jungles and inhospitable deserts, from expansive prairies to the steepest mountains. Completing the whole road trip will surely eat up all of your vacation allowance. According to Google Maps, you could make it in about 12 days if you really wanted to push yourself, but that's not considering traffic, pee breaks, or the minor factor that most people require sleep. If you factor in diversions for sightseeing, being highly recommended, it may take months to finish the journey. But if one sticks to the long asphalt snake, the fastest time by car is 23 days, 22 hours, and 43 minutes. By motorbike, the record is 34 days. And we have a special shout out to Austrian legend Michael Strasser, who cycled the whole 30,000 wow. miles in 84 days, 11 hours, and 50 minutes. Wow. That is impressive. Really Holy impressive. Crap, dude. To bicycle it. Oh my god. Oh man. Man, but you know, the the person in me that has gotten been bitten by the travel bug is like, okay, how do I make this work? How do I do this? You gotta have loads, loads of financial backing. A lot of money. Of yeah. media coverage. And like a, lot a of team to give you a buffer around especially South America and Central America. Yeah, yeah, and I need to brush up on my Espanol as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's part of it. And maybe have 
uh, you know, stuff for every single yeah. climate yeah. and to wear and find out how to eat cheaply and now to, you know, not get shot, you know? Yeah, you need, you, but you need to travel with an entourage. Like, right, right. You would need travel. to travel with, you would not, I would say, do not do that alone. Yeah. At all, at Don't least three, alone. at least three cars, at least three cars of, yeah. of an entourage that yeah. goes with you. Three people minimum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With the basics covered and the engine all warmed up, well, it's time to start our trip. The first leg of the journey moving from north to south is one starting from Dead Horse, Alaska. This is an unofficial stretch of the Pan Am, whose official designation is Dalton Highway. This road was built in 1974 in a support capacity to the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, and it stretches across inhospitable terrain and weather. In 2011, it was considered both by ABC and BBC to be one of the most dangerous highways in the world due to icy asphalt, terrible visibility, and the constant potential danger of avalanches. Temperatures here may plummet to minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 52 Celsius, and there are about 240 miles, that's 384 kilometers of road, without maintenance services of any kind. So better stock up wow. on fuel and pretzels before tackling this road. From the town of Fairbanks, the Dalton links to the Alaska Highway, the next segment of this odyssey. As the name suggests, the Alaska Highway crosses most of well, actually, Canada, but let me explain. This highway was built in 1942 by 10,000 troops from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The purpose was to link up Alaska with the other 48 states south of Canada in case of a Japanese invasion. The idea was that the Army could have rapidly deployed additional troops to defend the northernmost territory. After some 1,390 miles, the Alaska Highway terminates at Dawson Creek, British Columbia. No relation to Katie Holmes or James <laughs> Van Der Beek. From there, another 365 miles will lead to Edmonton, Alberta. Here, the traveler has two choices to navigate the estates until the Mexican border. The first option is to leave Alberta, enjoy the views offered by Saskatoon and Avon in Minneapolis via North Dakota. From there, travelers can follow Interstate 35, driving all the way to Nuevo Laredo, cutting through Dallas. This route is almost 2,560 miles long. The second option is to make another Canadian stop in Calgary, then cross the line over to Billings, Montana. From there, drivers can say hello to Colorado, holler to New Mexico, and howdy to Texas, where they can rejoin Interstate 35. This one is slightly shorter at 2,370 miles. I think I would go with the second option over the uh, the first one. It seems a little yeah. more scenic. Fun. Scenic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Colorado, for sure. N Nevada, for sure. And Texas, hell yeah. Yeah. Like, that's all. That's a that's the Grand Canyon route. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that much about you know Canada, and I mean we know most of the population lives near the border, so yeah. uh, probably a lot of forests and a lot of glaciers. Not not glaciers, snow. That's yeah. what I meant to say. No, glaciers is up there where you're coming yeah. from. Glaciers is way yeah. so like we saw those in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man. Mm -hmm. Now that we are in Nuevo Laredo, we can proudly announce that we are at the official starting point of the Autopista Americana. I'll be using that name too from now on because the rest of the countries we'll be visiting primarily speak Spanish. And as we have covered some of the geography of the Autopista, it's time to dig into some of its history too. The early plans to connect the Americas via land were conceived by sea. In late 1866, Hinton Rowan Helper, the U.S. consul to Argentina, was traveling from New York to Buenos Aires on a ship called Lord Clarendon. As he endured the long voyage plagued by seasickness, Helper had the first embryo of an idea in his vomit-prone heads, an intercontinental railroad along a north-south axis. The idea carried some serious weight. It wasn't just about sparing a consul some uncomfortable trips to the privy, it was about cementing trade and diplomatic relationships across a dozen countries belonging to an isolated continent, far removed from the commercial and political epicenters of Western Europe. And of course, it would have become a tool for the U.S. government to extend their political, diplomatic, and military influence over South America. Despite all the best intentions, this railroad never materialized. The U.S. originally proposed it at the first Pan American Conference in 1889. However, no agreement was reached for such a costly enterprise, and the plans were dropped. When American states convened again in Chile for their fifth conference in 1923, the railway had morphed into a highway. Travel on rubber rather than tracks was quickly becoming a more cost-effective option for international haul. 
Two years later, the first Pan American Highway Conference was summoned in October 1925 in Buenos Aires, with plans presented for a highway starting in Mexico and running to the Argentine capital. In 1929, Panama, Costa Rica, Honduras, and Guatemala all announced the imminent start of the first surveying works for the Central American stretch of the autopista, which took place between 1930 and 1933. In 1934, Mexico initiated the work to lay down the first segment of the highway leading into Guatemala. This was completed 16 years later in 1950. The plan was to continue further south to Panama. The resulting road would have been known as the Inter-American Highway. This next stretch of road was inaugurated more than 10 years later in 1961. In the meantime, participating nations had founded the Permanent Committee of the Pan-American Congress of Highways, an institution dedicated to overseeing and accelerating construction. All the while, the U.S. government participated and invested heavily in the project, despite the fact that no plans were ever made for this highway to extend north to Mexico. The first contributions approved by the United States Congress were some $50,000, which is about $768,000 in today's money, assigned to the early surveying work. Between 1930 and 1933, the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads even actively participated in such surveying. Things got even more serious in the following years. From 1934 to 1943, Congress authorized a further investment of $87 million, almost $1.3 billion in today's wow. currency. Then from 1950 to 1952, Congress funneled another $24 million towards the highway. These contributions were a massive commitment, especially the funds invested in the 30s and 40s. In that period, Washington's Treasury had other big concerns on its to-do list, minor snags like the Great Depression, for example, or President Roosevelt's New Deal, a plan which required extensive government expenditure in order to grow the economy. Moving into the 1940s, Roosevelt had pledged to support the Allied cause in World War II through the Lend-Lease Act, and then in December 1941, the U.S. fully joined the war. Such a dramatic 15-year period would have left most countries bankrupt. And yet, during this challenging time, the U.S. government found it worthwhile to invest in this highway to establish a strong physical link along the vertical axis of the Americas. Wow. wow. To think. I, I didn't think about that. Is This is all during the Depression, the New Deal, World War II, and yet they were still funding a highway in Central and South America because expansion because expansion in connectiveness and trade routes yeah power yeah. basically power. yeah yep. yeah and it would have gotten done even if it was a, a railroad but a highway i guess but, but is it a makes, better option it makes sense you know yeah. what happens though is that like like anything when you have multiple participants what happens when a country can't afford it you know what i mean yeah, they can't uh, they can't participate, and the whole thing falls apart. What? Mm -hmm. The political importance of such a link it can be traced back to 1823. In December of that year, U.S. President James Monroe first articulated the doctrine that bears his name. The Monroe Doctrine warned European powers from interfering in the affairs of the Western Hemisphere and, by extension, formalized the U.S. policy to directly interfere in the Americas against European meddling. For example, in 1865, Washington yeah. supported the revolt of Benito Juarez in Mexico against Austrian Emperor Maximilian. The unlucky monarch had been installed on the Mexican Mexican throne by Mr. Meddlesome himself, Napoleon III of France. And by the way, we have a fantastic video all about Max and Napoleon III on our sister channel, Biographics, which, uh, if you got time, definitely check out. The Mexican affair set the precedent for a series of U.S. diplomatic and military interventions in Latin America. During the first years of the 20th century, U.S. Marines intervened in Santo Domingo in 1904, Nicaragua in 1911, and Haiti in 1915. According to Washington's own national archives, these interventions ostensibly protected those countries from military action by European creditors, but they extended the U.S. sphere of influence along the way. Even So it was a, basically a big old F.U. Europe kind of thing. They were like, we got this. They're like, we're like when, I, when I say we, not just the U.S., but this whole stretch of land, leave this shit alone. You guys got yeah. the rest of the world. Let yeah. us I go fuck this. Yeah, worry about your own stuff. Yeah, this yeah. is ours now. Yeah, not Just as in, not as in like, uh, not as in like uh, colonialism per se, but as like, you don't touch this shit. This is America's North America, Central America, South America. 
The, this is the America's problem. Yeah, like we, yeah, we, this we is not your America problem. shit alone. Yeah, you don't touch our stuff, we don't touch your stuff. Yep. There's got to be a fat electrician video about there, something there, here. There will be. It has to be soon about this. Yes, yes. Without citing diplomatic doctrines, the U.S. investment in the Autopista Americana was dictated by a long-term plan arranged by the federal governments with private enterprises. The aim was to boost future trade with southern neighbors to encourage the growth of the automobile industry or simply to provide a convenient supply route for existing industrial and mining sites. A monumental example of one of these sites is the Chacuicamata copper mine in Chile, one of the largest excavation sites in the world. It started as a government-owned enterprise and was bought by the Guggenheim family in 1912. Copper was not the only South American commodity badly needed by Washington. A CIA report issued in 1952 when the Cold War had just got heated in Korea recognized the strategic importance of Latin America in providing supplies for the military. Latin America at present supplies the U.S. with over 30 strategic mineral, fiber, and chemical products. The area is the only Western Hemisphere source of 13 essential materials, including tin, cordage fibers, mica, quartz crystals, and monazite. Monazite is a primary ore of thorium, a highly radioactive metal which could be used as a replacement for uranium in nuclear power generation. And I'll let you ponder the strategic implications of that in an age of atomic standoff as we continue with our journey. Yeah, this whole little section here is just like the old geopolitical part of yep. building this thing. Like We got to the Texas-Mexico border and history lesson, y'all. Yeah, yep, here it is. This is why... Okay, halfway through. <laughs> so mm -hmm. what about the road, bro? What about the yeah. road? Yeah, I think he's getting to that now. <laughs> yeah. For its Central American segment, the Autopista will treat travelers to not one, not two, but six capital cities of the region. The first three off the list are Mexico City, then Guatemala City, and then San Salvador. The first official segment of the Autopista Americana, the Mexican one, is the only stretch of this road that was built without any U.S. contribution. Traveling here may also require some caution, as the Autopista is frequently used by the local drug cartels as a vital artery to smuggle their goods. The state of Guanajuato in particular is under the shadow of the cartel. Over a single week in December 2019, the cartel murdered 12 police officers, dumping the bodies of four of them on the Autopista Americana. After leaving Mexico behind, the trip continues through Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. After leaving the Costa Rican capital, San Jose, the Autopista will take drivers through one of its most difficult sections, which reaches an elevation of almost 11,000 feet at the Cerro de la Muerte. The mountain of death. This part of the highway is dead steep, riddled with potholes, concealed by fog, blind corners, and plunging cliffs. Careful drivers may want to take this road very slow, but still should watch out for the more experienced and aggressive ones who will take huge risks when overtaking. Depending on the season, the journey will be made even more interesting by fast winds, flash floods, and landslides. But travelers will be rewarded at the top. On a clear day, visitors will be treated to 360-degree views of a lush jungle framed by both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans on the horizon. Wow. Leaving the mountain behind, the autopista enters Panama, where soon drivers will have the chance to cross over the famous canal over the Bridge of the Americas. This is the rare encounter of two of the greatest engineering marvels of the world. The last stop in Panama is the town of Yavisa, and here it may feel like having reached literally the last stop as the autopista ends abruptly. And hang on, I hear you say, Simon, didn't you say that the Panamericana was going to go all the way down into the tip of Argentina? Well, yes, it is going to eventually, but there is another dangerous spot here, and this one cannot be traversed conventionally. And that's the Darien Gap. To this day, no roadworks have taken place in the gap, which constitutes a 60-kilometer, 100-mile intermission in the autopista. The work here was never completed for a whole variety of reasons. The Darien is one of the most inhospitable areas of the world, a terrain covered by thick jungles, swamplands, and mountains inhabited by jaguars and venomous snakes. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Spanish and Scottish settlers tried to build their respective colonies in the Darien Isthmus, but all attempts ended in disaster. You can learn more about this in our Geographics episode, The Darien Venture. Up until the 20th and even the 21st century, the area remains as difficult and expensive to build into as it was 
hundreds of years ago. Adding to that, there are other concerns. First of all, the area is home to several protected species, as well as indigenous groups like the Embera Unan and the Kuna. The construction of a road would pose a threat to their traditional cultures. Then there is a serious public health and economic worry. Central and Northern American health authorities estimate that a road in the Darien would facilitate the spread of foot and mouth disease north of Panama. This is a deadly viral disease which affects cows, among other animals. In other words, a unified autopsy is too much of a risk for cattle farmers and the meat industry. Crossing the Gap remains a dangerous adventure up to this day, as one may risk running into drug traffickers, local gangs, or Colombian guerrilla factions. And yet, the challenge has attracted some die-hard souls. In 1959, the Trans-Darian Expedition managed to travel the Darien in 136 days. Two days later, a team of three Chevrolet Corvairs repeated the enterprise, but only two emerged from the jungle. Both expeditions had to rely on boats for some of the passages. It wasn't until 1971 that British man Ian Hibble completed the first fully overland crossing of the Gap on a bicycle. More travelers have braved the Darien Emerald Hell in the following years, but I would like to remember especially those who did it on foot. In 1979, evangelist Arthur Blessett walked the length of the Darien while carrying a 12-foot wooden cross as part of a pilgrimage around the world. In 1989, George Megan also traversed the Gap, walking in a south-to-north direction. This was part of his challenge to walk the entire length of the Pan American Highway, which he completed in 2,425 days. But not wow. all of those who cross the Darien do it to beat a record. Journalist Adam Yamaguchi of CBS reported about the trials endured by migrants, not only from South America, who have to travel this route on foot to make it eventually to North America. For regular travelers or holidaymakers, the most common option to bypass the Darien is to catch a ferry to reach Colombia, or even, as some travel bloggers suggest, sell their car, fly to Colombia, and buy a new one once they're over there. Oh my god. Wow. Okay, okay. I think that's when I would catch a ferry or sell my car, go to Colombia, and buy a new one. Yep, yep. So what you need, what you need is a is a person on the inside out in Colombia to have cars lined up for you. All right. You know, All right. that way you sell your car and have already purchased and or acquired Colombian cars. All right. All right. Good to know. That way I don't get messed up in the yeah, Darien that, Gap. That, yeah, that way you're not you're not bogged down and distracted and downtime is not good in this area. I believe that you don't, 100%. don't yeah. You don't want to be without car or or yeah. It's, it's just good to keep moving. Get off the ferry, get your cars, go. Yeah, yeah. I believe you. Sell their car, fly to Colombia, and buy a new one once they're over there. In Colombia, drivers can put their cars in turbo as they resume the autopista in, well, turbo, a port city on the Gulf of Uraba. In Colombia, the autopista will make its way through Medellin and Cali before crossing the border into Ecuador. The next big city on the horizon is the Ecuadorian capital, Quito, which at 9,350 feet is the second highest capital city in the world. From Quito to Valparaiso, Chile, the autopista will closely shadow the Pacific coastline of the South American landmass, cutting through all of Peru. As reported by the Smithsonian Magazine, this section also ranks as one of the most dangerous ones of the whole journey. The road here is lined with thousands of crosses bearing the names and dates of death of accident victims. The reason for this high death toll is the excessive traffic of heavy commercial vehicles bearing dangerous cargo. For example, on August 13, 2005, just north of the town of Kasma, a minibus struck a vehicle carrying combustible fluids. This resulted in a deadly explosion which killed 14 people. Leaving behind wow. Peru and entering Chile, drivers are welcomed by the Atacama Desert. This area is also not one to take lightly, as it is the driest non-polar region in the world. The desert is larger than the whole country of Panama and sits at an elevation of 7,900 feet. It receives only 15 millimeters of rainfall a year. By oh. comparison, annual rainfall in the Sahara is 100 millimeters. Yet, the well-prepared, well-hydrated tourist could enjoy otherworldly sights such as the Rainbow Valley. This is where flanks of cliffs reveal layers of green, blue, pink, and yellow minerals. There's also the Moon Valley, an extraterrestrial landscape which may get many conspiracy theorists wondering if Aldrin, Armstrong, and Collins were really just in South America in 1969. Finally, there is the Death Valley, where steep, sharp rock formations issue a palpable threat to those who venture here. 
From Valparaiso in central Chile, the autopista veers west, climbing up the Andes before plunging into the tunnel Cristo Redentor. Three kilometers long, it connects Chile to Argentina and its luscious pampas, the fertile lowlands once home of the legendary gauchos. After journeying through this expanse of grass, drivers will reach the Argentine capital, Buenos Aires, the last stop of the official route of the Autopista Americana. But once one gets there, why not go through to the end of the world? Heading south on Argentina National Route 3, there are only 3,000 more kilometers to go. The road will require crossing the border again with Chile and ferrying across the Straits of Magellan before reaching Tierra del Fuego, back again in Argentina. Here awaits the final stop, the world's most southerly city, Ushuaia. Originally, Ushuaia was Argentina's biggest penal colony, where many anarchists were exiled from the mainland. The prisoners transformed the area, raising the city from scratch, building whole streets of houses, bridges, and railways. Wow. Nowadays, it maintains its atmosphere of a frontier town, albeit one that is full of attractions for tourists. A trip such as one along this highway or autopista is a true adventure, one undertaken without a destination for the sole purpose of enjoying the journey, dangerous but exciting. I'll conclude with a quote from the great Bruce Chatwin, one who knew one or two things about Patagonia and about traveling in general. The real home of man is not his house, but the road. And I really hope you did find that video interesting. Wow. That's incredible. That's crazy, man. Oh, man. If, if I yeah. was younger, boy, man, that yeah. would be one hell of a trip. I'm waiting to see how these UK vlogs do on ETS, and then oh maybe God, the travel bug might bite me and bro if if the people are out there for this thing i'll go with you people come out for it um, yeah, they gotta come out for it that's the thing man. let's see and if anybody here has attempted to do the whole pan american highway deal from start to finish let us know tell us your story any tips for people that are trying to do it themselves and, and if you guys reside anywhere near any section of this pan american highway please put your country and what span that you've traveled because i would love to piece together a tour at least mexico down south yeah because i'm pretty I, honestly i'm pretty sure i don't think we could get to wherever ice ice places all at the top it would take an act of god for us to get all the way to the top that's like hitchhiking with tractor trailers up to get up there probably. right 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 i don't know if flix bus would uh take us up there no no or that's amtrak i bet you you're gonna go through three vehicles i Easy. believe it one for that tundra tundra area then easy easy sailing to texas and then from there you're i don't know what you're driving whatever's down there pretty yeah. much you Whatever can't can just get... take a probably in that case the smaller more fuel efficient is the way to go hell probably a hybrid or something yeah like a toyota camry hybrid or something yeah or i would say maybe the like highlander something where like, you can carry extra fuel with you right because like, that's and and you would have to take a mechanic in the group for sure yep someone sure. someone that knows what they're doing with cars yeah you'd have to have the main vehicle and then your parts vehicle behind you right. in case like a mobile right. garage going with you and as i gotta be careful going through that little part of mexico that the cartels are uh are doing it just keep calm carry on have yep. uh, have a bunch of fuel with you have snacks with you try not to make any stops am i right to think that yeah, i would say that and also travel in a big group i yeah. know that sounds crazy but have clout have eyes on you because that's a that's the best way for people not to to f with you you know, granted that's a double-edged sword in, his, in and of itself they want right. to go unnoticed or be the most noticed effing thing out there right it's more than just another mouth to feed it's your lifeline but anyway no this was interesting man yeah, i would love yeah. to see what the comments say in this in this be looking at the comments of this one for darn sure yeah. oh. thanks for watching yep. look forward to those comments consider subscribing watching another video thank you channel members for your support what now dan Make sure you guys unplug and, and go enjoy a ride out there. That's right. We'll see y'all next time. Bye.